Let's get it, although I'm not sure if I'm ready. I am Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour talking about professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in, iHeart, American Forces Radio, SportsByline.com, over-the-air affiliates like KMAV, 99 KMSR, and the Mightier 1090. Maybe you're listening on podcast or replays on Sirius XM. Maybe you're video streaming on Twitch or YouTube. However you're joining me today, I'd just like to say thank you. Hopefully wherever you are, it's sunny outside. And if not, hopefully it's sunny inside your mind. I was going to say it was a beautiful sunny day here on my portion of Del Marva, but as I look out the window here past this huge box of light that is blinding me right now, looks like it, it has turned a little bit gray out there. Although... Talk about a gray start to the show. The story I have to lead off is not a good one, although it could have been much, much worse. If you haven't heard this one, it's up on the main page right now at WrestlingObserver.com. Independent wrestler Darnell Cottrell, better known as Black G's, was shot on Thursday night during a carjacking attempt in Philadelphia. Cottrell was rolled up on by four masked individuals and during the exchange was shot once in the hip. Cottrell, who does have a permit for a concealed carry, was able to return fire and the assailants ran off. Police investigators are currently reviewing surveillance footage for any possible leads. Cottrell was scheduled to make his in-ring return to wrestling on Saturday for the NWA after being out almost a year as he dealt with multiple myeloma, a form of blood cancer that develops in plasma cells of the bone marrow. In a statement issued by the NWA, Cottrell expressed his gratitude for the support he's received so far, stating, quote, I was looking forward to making my return this weekend. I would love to make the trip regardless of the soreness and pain that I'm in. However, However, my gut tells me to stay home with my family this weekend. I look forward to making my return at the next NWA event. Thank you to everyone for your continued support. So all the best going out to Black G's and his family. And uh, again, that could have been a far worse situation. The stories will get better from here, folks. I promise you that. It is a busy weekend on the canvas, Matt. And I'm going to try to get to as much of it as I can. Coming up on Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Sempervivi here with you. You know, we do this show right here, Wrestling Observer Live, for an hour at a time. But if you want us 24-7, you can try to find us on Twitter slash X. I am at Sempervivi. Brian is at Brian Alvarez. Filthy Tom Lawler is at Filthy Tom Lawler. The timeline for this show is at WONF4W. And the broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. Jim Valley is at Jim Valley. He'll be here with you tomorrow on Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific. And then Andrew Zarian at Andrew Zarian. He's here with you on Sundays starting at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific. Make the wrestling news part of your day as well. Everything you need to know to get your day started, get you up to date, or get you to your favorite wrestling review pod like Dave and Brian on Wrestling Observer Radio. Each episode of the Wrestling News is between 5 and 15 minutes long every day, 365 days a year. No clickbait, no speculation or rumors, just the news you need to know. Find it wherever you get your favorite podcasts or head on over to the WrestlingNews.com and at Wrestling News AV on Facebook and Twitter. Who said this? Was it you, Michael Bubble or Michael Buble, 4422? who apparently is getting his messages deleted in here by DJ Convoy. Hmm. Do I want Bill Belichick in Atlanta? No. No, I don't want Bill Belichick in Atlanta. Why would I want Bill Belichick in Atlanta? Just to rub in the fact that, you know, 28 to 3 happened? No, I don't want that. Man is in his 70s, for God's sakes. We're not getting rid of Rich McKay. He's still going to be running football operations, so... Bill Belichick on the, the field for Atlanta? No, doesn't work for me whatsoever. Antonio Pierce, if the Raiders decide to lose their mind and throw a bunch of money at Jim Harbaugh, I'll take him. From there, I'm not real sure. I wonder if Nick Saban would want to come up. Never mind, never mind. Don't want to think about that right now. And God knows we don't want to get Brian sent any emails because I was talking about football, even though football is going to impact some of the wrestling you're going to be watching this weekend. 
bulk of the games on Sunday. There is a game on Monday. I think at least one on Monday, but there are two on Saturday. Although one of one of them is on Peacock. It's going to be interesting to see what that number does. Saturday, Cleveland and uh, Buffalo are at 430 uh, on NBC, Miami, and Kansas City at 815. A Peacock exclusive game. I believe I saw somewhere that the late AFC wildcard game that would have been in that spot did like 20 million people on NBC. So you know it's not going to do that much on Peacock, but it's going to be interesting to see what that does and what the response is to that. Because obviously there's a loose tie. There's a loose tie in with everything that that's in media now. Because does it go on streaming, the network, all that sort of stuff? Will streaming services get together? You know, there's if, if WBD and and uh, Paramount are to merge, which I don't think will happen because it's just there's too much, too many pieces at play there that I don't think the government would let go through. But, you know, part of the, the reason that they're talking about merging those brands is because both of them are looking at Max and Paramount Plus and going, well, imagine this together, what we could do in, in the, the production houses we've had and all that sort of stuff. And obviously there's a lot of talk of WWE going to Amazon. When it comes to Monday Night Raw, I still don't like that idea. I still don't know how I feel about that. I know that that if it's about money, and it's always about money, that Amazon's going to offer the most amount of money. I mean, they gave Judge Judy, like, what was it? $25 $25 million or something like that for like 25 episodes of her show. I think I have it here somewhere. It, it's an extreme amount of money that they will spend for a service that, I mean, I'll look at the chat here, not the YouTube chat, but I do have the, the Twitch chat open. I mean, does anyone use the free V service? The former IMDB.TV, which is owned by Amazon, that's their free streaming service. And I know that Raw won't go on there, but like they seem to spend a whole lot of money on shows that I, I, I just I don't know how much visibility they get. I'm just I'm very interested to see how all of this shakes out, because I still don't think that this is a a good idea for for Raw. I, I just don't, and I know I'm old, and that's part of the reason why, and I, I get it that, you know, hey, I'll, I'll go to Amazon and I'll watch Thursday Night Football, so there are going to be wrestling fans that absolutely, no matter what, will tune in and, and, and watch Raw, but I just... I just still don't think that it these things are established enough, and I think you're going to lose a lot of visibility. The money that you make, I don't know. I don't know. And I know that NXT is going to probably be up a lot on CW. At the very least, it's going to hold steady the seven fifty to 800000 that it's doing now. I bet you it's going to do more than that on the CW, maybe not significantly more. We know that SmackDown is going to fall because... There has not been a case where a show has moved from network to cable and done better. It just it has not done that. We know it does over two million people on Fridays on Fox. When it goes to FS1, it's going to do around a million. I uh, assume we should probably safely assume whatever Raw is doing right now. That's probably what SmackDown is going to do on USA. And there's no shame in that. Obviously, USA is going to be incredibly happy about that because. You know, that brings up all of their shows just by having WWE on there. So we'll see what happens again. If this is about the money, then it is going to be Amazon. And with the state of the TKO stock right now and how unimpressed that the market was when they nailed their deal with USA for SmackDown. Mm, well, You'll probably want to make those people happy as much as you can, and that's probably going to be the highest bidder, and that's probably going to be Amazon. But got a bunch of stuff that is far more pressing right now, which includes the speculation that Roman Reigns and The Rock could take place at Elimination Chamber as opposed to WrestleMania. Well, Dave Meltzer in this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter has thrown some cold water on that. As Reigns isn't even scheduled for the show, 
This was posted up to the main page of WrestlingObserver.com today by Joseph Courier. Meltzer wrote in the newsletter, quote, Regarding the Reigns versus Rock match, while I presume it's WrestleMania and could possibly be a three-way with Cody Rhodes, what we did have confirmed is that the Australia rumors are not accurate. Reigns is not even scheduled for the show, he's never been advertised, and there are no plans for him on that date right now. That show is being held at Optus Stadium in Perth, Australia on Saturday, February 24th. The Rock made a surprise return to WWE on the day one edition of Raw. At the end of the appearance, Rock teased that he wants to face Reigns and take his spot at the head of the table. Paul Heyman then came out and cut a promo on SmackDown. Last week, responding to The Rock's comments, Heyman said that Rock has not been invited to the table, nor will he. At one point last year, a Rock against Reigns match was tentatively planned for WrestleMania 39, but didn't end up happening. Obviously, we got Roman Reigns against Cody Rhodes. Rhodes told Sports Illustrated earlier on this week that despite the returns of both The Rock and CM Punk, his goal is still to headline WrestleMania 40 in April against Reigns, saying, quote, The Rock is the great one. He's still electrifying. CM Punk is one of the greatest stars in the history of wrestling. I know what I'm up against. Look at the roster. It's loaded with stars, but that doesn't bother me. I'm not flinching. I'm not rooting against anyone else. I'm just working to make it happen, end quote. Reigns' next undisputed WWE Universal Championship defense will be at the Royal Rumble later on this month. He is defending against Randy Orton, LA Knight, and AJ Styles in a fatal four-way match. Going to be really interesting to see how all of these things play out. There's a lot going on in that universe right now, especially when you throw in the names of CM Punk and Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre. And Money in the Bank briefcase holder, Damian Priest. But a lot going on there. Still got a lot to go on this show. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. Uh, back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. WWE SmackDown tonight, live on Fox from the Pinnacle Bank Arena in Lincoln, Nebraska. I don't know if Roman Reigns is going to be there. I assume Paul Heyman is going to be there at the very least. I know Bailey is going to be there because she's going to be wrestling Bianca Belair. Cameron Grimes is going to be wrestling Grayson Waller. And then we get the match that I'd like to see and how a lot of these SmackDowns have gone. We only have four or five matches. You know, one usually gets over 20 minutes. Give that 20 minutes to the LWO, Cruz del Toro and Joaquin Wild against the other LWO, the Legato World Order, Angel Garza and Humberto Carrillo with Santos Escobar in their corner. I'm hoping this is a standout match. I like both of those teams a lot. You know, I was so happy to see Imperium in there, and it's like, okay, maybe they're doing something, you know, with, with Kofi teaming up with Jay. Maybe we'll get a little series with them and Imperium for a while. We'll get to see Giovanni Vinci show off on the main roster. He really hasn't had a chance to do that at all yet. And he gets knocked loopy and gets knocked out, and he's out of there. You know, one thing, too, and I, I just want to take it back to all the drama that's taking place right now around the both world championship scenes in WWE and what the main events might be for night one and night two of WrestleMania. Um, you know, Roman Reigns wrestling on both nights. I mean, I guess that is possible, but I'm interested in... in and what's going to happen with Seth's title and if he even makes it to WrestleMania with it? And if he does, who does he wrestle? And if he doesn't, who does he lose it to? Because I know Damian Priest has had that briefcase for a long time. But as Drew McIntyre brought up on Raw this past Monday night, you know, you went in there to, to cash that thing and you screwed up my shot. You know, you screwed everything up for both of us. And... The way things have been leading, it certainly feels like Drew McIntyre is going to be welcomed in to the Judgment Day, and Damian Priest will be going out of the Judgment Day. Does Drew screw over Damian Priest in his attempt to cash in the briefcase? Or does he beat Damian Priest before the briefcase and go on and try to cash it in himself? I would assume that he's going to screw up Damian Priest but then in that case, if that happens before Mania, well, then who does Seth face? Is it Cody Rhodes? 
where you put the belt on Cody and Roman does whatever he's going to do with the rock. And then Cody's got his belt, but he's not fulfilled. I still haven't, you know, have not finished my story yet. And I'm going to hold this title, but I'm going to hold on to it until I can face Roman Reigns. And if you're to believe that Roman Reigns is going to surpass Hulk Hogan's record, well, that means, well, it's not Hulk Hogan's record, but the length of time Hogan has held the belt, which I guess is third longest of all time now, I believe. If it's, uh, it would definitely be Bruno first, and I guess it would be Backlund second at that point, and then Hogan. Well, you know, if, if that's the case, and Roman's got to hold it, to mania of next year in, in all likelihood right i don't know it's it's interesting though how they're going to try to move all these pieces around and how happy everybody's going to be by the time the thing is over my friends over at the black wrestling podcast last night were talking you know could could it be possible that roman opens up night one and then closes night two which sounds ridiculous and sacrilegious on the surface but We've had big, you know, openings to WrestleMania. We've had title matches open WrestleMania before. And if he's going to be wrestling on both shows, you know, him opening one and then closing night two would probably be the way to go. But I don't know. It's This is all very interesting here because they're kind of cooking with gas right now. WWE is pretty hot. And regardless of what you think about them, the perception is they are hot and they do have... A whole lot of hot stars, or at least, at the very least, if not hot, they have a bunch of stars that people are believing in right now to certain degrees. And that includes Damian Priest and and, and Drew McIntyre and, and guys like that, as well as Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes and The Rock, obviously, now being back in the mix. WWE SmackDown, as I mentioned tonight, live on Fox. WWE is also running two house shows this weekend as well, both of which are in New Mexico. Saturday, you're going to be in Las Cruces, New Mexico, at the Pan American Center. And on Sunday, the crew moves to the Event Center in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Rancho Relaxo. I believe that's where, where Marge got sent off to on The Simpsons. Monday Night Raw is going to be taking place in North Little Rock, Arkansas at the Simmons Bank Arena. NXT is also running two house shows this weekend. Tonight they're going to be at the Dade City Armory in Dade City, Florida. And on Saturday night that crew will move to Fort Pierce at the Haven L. Fenn Center. Hall of Fame announcer Jim Ross says that his AEW contract expires next month, but he hopes to be on the call for Sting's last match at Revolution in March. I was going to bring this up at some point. You know, I was actually going to do it on one of the shows I missed for being sick. Uh, but I don't have to anymore because Jim Ross has already said it for me. I think the call of that match should be Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone. And they don't have to do anything the rest of the night on that show. But I think for that final match, I just want to hear those two and nobody else. And this story was posted up to the main page of the site last night by Ethan Renner. Ross opened up about his AEW contract status on this week's episode of his Grilling JR podcast, where he revealed that his deal expires on February 14th. Ross also said that he had a conversation with AEW owner Tony Khan about being on the commentary team with Tony Schiavone for Sting's retirement match set for March 3rd. Quote, I mentioned that to Tony Khan last night. He agreed. It's only right. It makes sense. How can I say this without sounding like a turd? I think there's money in Shivani and I working together, not just in Greensboro, but going forward sporadically. And we have great chemistry. We've never lost that. If he and I are doing the match with Sting and company, I believe it's the right thing to do. And I need to get signed up so I can be there. Ross then went on to say that he hopes to end his career in AEW, saying that he loves working with them. I'm biased here. I mean, you can't really see it, but, you know, Jim Ross would always carry around a a baseball card of Mickey Mantle in his wallet and actually met Mickey Mantle uh, drinking seven and sevens. Uh, I think drank seven, seven and sevens on a flight that they were both on together. But I got my Jim Ross card uh, right up here from, I don't know how old that thing is at this point. It was a WWF card. And that, uh, one of these said we'd signed pieces of Matt from the, from back in the day from, from some event there. But I like Jim Ross, and I'm a big fan of announcers, even when they get a little long in the tooth, even when they lose a little off their fastball. 
you know, Vern Lundquist, you know, Keith Jackson, you know, towards the end, you know, your 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 John Maddens, even Al Michaels now. I know he takes a lot of abuse for for not being into things uh doing Thursday night football, although I kind of don't blame him. He's kind of the voice of the fan, frankly, sometimes with some of the calls that he makes. Uh but you know, I like seeing those guys, and I don't think Jim Ross needs to be out there for every show. I don't think Tony Schiavone should be out there for every show, frankly. I to be honest, I would rather just be a two-man a two-man team with Taz and Excalibur I would be completely fine with that but I do like having Shivani and Ross sprinkled in sometimes and I definitely think for a match like this you know Sting's last match in Carolina all of this stuff looping back around to the 80s and the tie-ins to to Crockett and all that sort of stuff it is only right that Tony Shivani and Jim Ross be on that call and I would kind of hope that they're on that call again just those two, unless unless Bob Cottle's voice, God bless him, and he's in his 90s at this point, is really good. I wouldn't bring anybody else out there except for those two guys. Speaking of AEW, Rampages tonight, Homecoming on TNT, taped last Wednesday at Daly's Place in Jacksonville. For the AEW Continental Triple Crown, Eddie Kingston defends against Wheeler Yuta during his promo on Dynamite Wednesday night. Yuta made sure to point out that Eddie may have to beaten the rest of the Blackpool Combat Club during the Continental Classic, but he did not beat him. And in fact, Wheeler Yuta has been on a nine-match rampage win streak. No spoilers for any of these things. Swerve Strickland will be taking on Matt Seidel. Hikaru Shida will face Queen Amanada, who did pick up a win last night on ROH in a four-corner survival match against Diamante, Lady Frost, and Trisha Dora. And there's also going to be a, again, no spoilers here, on this AEW Rampage homecoming show where Brody, almost said Brody King, where Brody Lee was honored. Six-person tag team match, The Dark Order, Alex Reynolds, Evil Uno, and John Silver with negative one in their corner against Angelo Parker, Matt Menard, and Jake Hager. I don't think you need any spoilers to see who's going to win that. AEW Collision is Saturday night live on TNT from Norfolk, Virginia. The Chartway Arena at the Ted Constant Convocation Center on the campus of Old Dominion University. I like that building. I've seen UFC in that building. I've seen an old Impact TNA taping in that building. And uh, I, I, I like it down there. It's a good place to run wrestling, too, especially when people are, the schools are in, because there are so many schools in in the in that area of the tidewater and of Delmarva and the the seven five seven the seven cities of of Norfolk and Newport News and Hampton Roads and Tidewater and all that down there it is a it is packed and there are a ton of colleges and again this is probably smart timing right now I don't know if school's in session or not but you know when it is you can usually get a pretty good crowd Adam Copeland is going to be wrestling on the show got Deanna Perrazzo debuting against Red Velvet, ROH World Six-Man Tag Team Titles, the Mogul Embassy against Lance Archer and The Righteous. And, of course, immediately following Collision, there's going to be a Battle of the Belt show, and we'll get to that in a moment, but why would you have the ROH Six-Man Title match on that? I don't know. But we got news on that because Brian Cage is actually painting a little bit as he goes into that World Six-Man Tag Team title match. I'll let you know about that and so much more when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper Vivi here with your Wrestling Observer Live. Big Boss Man Brian Alvarez is out doing whatever the Big Boss Man does on a Friday now. Maybe he's saying he's out at his kid's school. I doubt that. He's probably just got his feet kicked up on the couch downstairs taking a big nap. I don't know where Filthy Tom Lawler is either. I didn't even ask him to be on the show with me today, considering that he filled in so admirably for me so many times while I was out here uh, sick here and in pain in a bit. And speaking of pain, as I mentioned, Brian Cage is in some pain right now. On Instagram Thursday, he wrote that he's been dealing with a torn lat muscle, which he injured during the fatal four-way match on the January 3rd episode of Dynamite. Cage said that it happened when Trent Beretta gave him a German suplex from the second rope. He was obviously wrestling on Dynamite this week. And then will be on Collision uh, coming up here on, on Saturday, defending those ROH World Six-Man Tag Team titles. And again, I don't know why that match is not on Battle of the Belts. 
Uh, I believe there's two matches that has been that have been announced for Battle of the Belts. I'm sure they're going to add one more here. But Julia Hart against Anna J for the TBS title and the AEW World Tag Team title. Big Bill and Ricky Starks against the ever popular Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara. So going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. <laughs> do you go ahead and do the New Jack thing and and play Judas for the entire match? I don't know if that's ultimately going to work. You know, it worked for New Jack. It, it worked in the uh, the match with Moxley where they played Wild Thing. And Brian was right about that. Dave was wrong when people were, oh, they were sick of it. No, no, it's like the joke where it plays once and people laugh. And plays twice, people laugh. Plays that third time and people growl a little bit. But then it just keeps happening and it's just so ridiculous you got to go with it. Just like the New Jack thing. I don't know if it'll work in this case with Judas, but... We'll see what they do there. I still think it's probably better. And again, I know Sammy's been turned as many times as the big show has, it feels like. But I would go ahead and just turn Ricky Starks and Big Bill. People want to cheer Ricky Starks. They want to get behind Ricky Starks. You can make Jer Jer Jericho and Guevara heels. Depending on what you're doing with the Young Bucks anyway, when it mixes up with Sting and all that, I mean, they can be heels. FTR can be heels against Big Bill and Ricky Starks. You got enough. You got Buddy and Brody or, or Buddy and Brody and, and Malachi, some combination of the House of Black. They are heels, so I don't know. Big Bill and Ricky Starks, again, I'd, I'd like to see them as baby faces, but we'll see. Got some ratings news on AEW. Wednesday's edition of Dynamite notched 797,000 viewers on TBS, according to Russell Nomics. That was down slightly from last week's 801,000 viewers. Second lowest audience for the show since October 25th. If you're looking for the silver lining in the key 18 to 49 year old demographic, the rating was a 0.29, up nearly 12% from last week. So the show started off big uh, when it <laughs> but again it, it tends to start off big with the lead-in that it gets uh from uh young sheldon or big bang theory whatever the hell it is there it started off with 1.001 million people and it dropped precipitously through the next half hour i mean it's probably better to look at quarter two and kind of start there in 895,000 people. But then at 830, it fell to 795. And it's like, eh, that's not good. Bounced back up to 915,000 viewers. And then really fell. And the last second hour did average it out to only be 700,000. And that doesn't include the 688,000 overrun for the four minutes that it had. But... I mean, this seemed to be a case where, you know, you can throw out the first quarter sometimes because, to me, you, you are getting this lead in. But it felt with this one that, like, there were a lot of AEW fans as as part of that that literally did tune in and then went, eh, okay, we'll come back later. Because, obviously, at 8.45 to 9, which I'm sure was to see what was going to happen, you know, in the, the, the over... You know, the 9 o'clock or the 8 o'clock turning into 9 hour, I mean, 915,000 people. That did its highest number for 18 to 49, so 465,000 of them. And then it collapsed in that last quarter hour of 9.45 to 10 o'clock for a match that was very exciting. It was very fun with Darby Allen and Sting against Kanoste Takeshita and Powerhouse Hobbs. I mean, again, all stars on paper. 636,000 people in that last 15 minutes. And that's rough. No matter how you cut it, that was rough and a, a surprise. I would have felt, would have figured that it would have held a lot better, but unfortunately it did not. Does it matter to WBD? Maybe. Maybe not. But regardless, they're going to put out a press release saying that they're happy because they're happy enough. <laughs> With what AEW is doing right now, they they put out a, a a a media release as all networks do to hype up their programming. And AEW had its ratings and viewership success in 2023 touted up. 
WBD wanted to point out AEW programming on both TBS and TNT ranked in the top 10 of all cable programming 72 times in what they call the coveted demo of under 50. 50 of those occurrences ranked in the top five of the demo. AEW programming on TBS and TNT reached 15.6 million viewers in the fourth quarter, up 3% year over year. And AEW programming reached nearly 4 million viewers each week across TNT and TBS. So... There you go. There's the the hype from WBD. We'll see if their negotiations with WWE go anywhere or if AEW stays put. Kind of hope for AEW's sake that they just stay put. And WWE does take a deal somewhere else because, you know, for AEW, if WBD is going to get in the WWE business and they're going to be in the NBA business, and I would assume... That they're going to be in the NBA business, regardless of what happens with WWE. I mean, they're 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 not going to want to throw money. I wouldn't think that much at, at two wrestling groups. I just I don't believe that's going to happen. And then in that case, man, I don't like AEW on Amazon. That's for sure. If I don't like WWE on Amazon, I really don't like any thoughts of AEW being on Amazon. And then from there, what do you do? You know, again, Paramount has shown no interest, and considering that they're in the debt that they're in right now and trying to shovel that away, I can't see them picking it up. So, again, it, it they fall into a real precarious situation that way if AEW or if WBD decides to get in bed with WWE. In some other television news, Vice's Dark Side of the Ring is set to return for a fifth season, according to a PW Insider report on Thursday. The new lineup is scheduled to premiere in March, although it has not been announced what topics the episode will cover this year. Dark Side debuted in April of 2019 and has previously covered such subjects as the murder of Bruiser Brody, the death of Owen Hart, and the tragedy of the Von Erichs, which I saw after the release of The Iron Claw that uh, they put up in their in, in its entirety on the Vice YouTube page. So if you are one of the people out there who has no access to Vice, they have put up some of those dark sides, as I mentioned, including the one that they did well, last year or two years ago on the Von Erichs, is now up in its entirety on their YouTube page. New Japan, Battle of the Valley 3, takes place on Saturday night. The Civic in San Jose it will be available through Triller TV. We went over the card yesterday. One interesting situation. TMDK, Bad Dude Tito, and Zack Sabre Jr. against Matt Riddle and a mystery opponent or a mystery partner. Jeff Cobb, I guess, makes some sense there. If Will Ospreay is not going to be the leader of United Empire, then what happens with the United Empire? Could we see a change at the top? Is that where Matt Riddle comes in? Do we see an entirely new group that starts that includes Matt Riddle and Jeff Cobb? I don't know, but it, it, it makes sense that it would be Jeff Cobb. Could it be someone else from the outside? I guess it could be. You know, could it be a, a Ryan Nemeth? I, I wouldn't think so. Or Nick Nemeth? I, I don't think so. I would have figured they would have announced him. Could we have a, a complete surprise? And somebody that we're not expecting show up there, like, I don't know, um, Moose, you know, or somebody like that, you know, sure. I mean, that that could be the case as well, but going to be interesting. Going to be interesting to see what the response is to Riddle on that show. Going to be interesting to see who his partner is going to be. AEW Continental Classic Triple Crown. If Eddie Kingston survives Wheeler Yuta, he'll be facing Gabe Kidd in a match that should be really, really fun. Julia defends the NJPW Strong Women's title, possibly for the last time on American soil against Trisha Dora. Strong open weight tag team title, but not the IWGP World Tag Team title, which to me is ridiculous. Get rid of these stupid strong titles. Like you got rid of the strong heavyweight title because it's part of the Continental Classic Triple Crown gimmick. You've gotten rid of Strong off the branding of these shows. They're New Japan shows. Stop it with the Strong titles, please. Just make it the tag title. Be done with it. Grills of Destiny, El Fantasma, and Hikaleo are going to defend the Strong titles against Bullet Club War Dogs, Alex Coughlin, and Clark Connors. 
TJP against David Finley in a non-title match. Rocky Romero and Soberano Jr. against Mascar Dorado and Volador Jr. That should be awesome. I cannot wait to see that one. That is going to be fun. Shingo against John Moxley, no disqualification. That ought to be pretty fun as well, too. And, of course, well, there's the main event, too. But should mention Fred Ross for Jacob Fatu and Shota Umino against Team Filthy. I'm not feeling good about Team Filthy's chances there against that very unique lineup of show- shooter Jacob Fatu and Fred Rosser. Interesting combination there. And the main event, Kazuchika Okada against Will Ospreay. The last time that those men are associated with New Japan on a New Japan show against each other? It's possible. Obviously, Ospreay's signed by AEW. He's going to be starting up there full-time in the uh, first quarter or after the first quarter of the year here. And uh, Kazuchika Okada, where will he go? Will he stay in New Japan, or is he going to be on his way to WWE or or maybe even AEW? We're going to find out. Kickoff show's got Matt Vandergriff against Goldie and a New Japan Strong women's title number one contender match between Stephanie Vacare and Viva Van. Impact? Also returns this weekend to its total nonstop action roots on Saturday with Hard to Kill at the Palms Casino in Las Vegas. Josh Alexander against Josh Hammerstone. PCO against Dirty Dango, who will have Alpha Bravo and Oleg Prudius in their corner, in his corner. And a TNA Knockouts World Title Number One Contendership. Uh, Ultimate X Match, Alicia Edwards against Giselle Shaw, Zaya Brookside making her debut. Danny Luna, Tasha Steeles, and Jody Threat. TNA World Tag Title, ABC against the Grizzled Young Veterans against the Rascals. Chris Sabin against Kushido and Vikingo for the X Division title. Knockouts World Title, Trinity against Jordan Grace. Alex Shelley against Moose. And on the Countdown Show, Rich Swan against Steve Macklin. Eric Young and Frankie Kazarian against Brian Myers and Eddie Edwards. And for the D- TNA Digital Media title, no DQ, Tommy Dreamer against Crazy Steve. DNA has also got a show called Snake Eyes taking place on Sunday that's also going to be at the Palms. Six-man tag team match, the Motor City Machine Guns and Kazuchika Okada against Brian Myers, Moose, and Eddie Edwards. And Josh Alexander is scheduled to face off against Will Ospreay. Got the short segment coming up here. Put a bow on this show, but I got some more shows that I'm going to have to run down, and I'm only going to have two minutes to do it. We'll see if I got enough wind. Wrestling Observer Live. Uh, back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. So much stuff taking place this weekend. TNA also announced today that it would be holding TV tapings at Philadelphia's 2300 Arena on Friday, March 22nd and Saturday, March 23rd. Matches for the tapings will be announced over the next few weeks. Tickets for the tapings are going on sale 10 a.m. Eastern Time on Saturday, January 20th. GCW is this weekend. Two shows. Tonight, No Compadre at the Leah Hall in Chicago. Streaming on Triller TV. Blake Christian. I don't know how many title defenses he's had. It's like 36 title defenses or something like that. Facing off against Calvin Tankman. GCW tag title, Violence is Forever. Against Bang and Matthews, the former Bang Bros that Brian loves so much. And Rena Yamashita defends a GCW Ultra Violent title against John Wayne Murdoch. This show was scheduled to have Andrade L. Idolo on it. He was pulled from the show, replaced by Leo Rush, facing off against Jonathan Gresham, and then also Mustafa Ali against Gringo Loco in what ought to be a hell of a match there. Tomorrow, GCW runs another Fight Plus Triller TV, whatever the hell you want to call it, show 56 Birds in Columbus, Ohio at the Valleydale Ballroom. Another GCW tag title match with Violence in Forever and Bangin' Matthews. Whoever wins the titles... They'll be in the ring with each other again alongside the rejects of John Wayne Matthews and Reed Bentley. Also, a six-person tag, Alec Price, Braden Toon, Dante Leone against Ciclope, Miedo Extremo, and Rina Yamashita, Leo Rush against Myron Reed, and Joey Janela against Microman. That's going to be something else. It's also going to be a real underrated, probably really good wrestling match. Jonathan Gresham against Cole Radrick. I like both of those guys a lot for different reasons, and Cole Radrick slowly... Been been taking steps up here, and you know does a lot of the uh, gets thrown around a lot. Does a lot of the uh, the the bleeding and the the fighting and the fussing and all that. But you know he got to where he got to by being pretty good on the mat and by uh, being pretty sharp. And I'd like to see him back there and in a in a true wrestling match. And with Jonathan Gresham, we're gonna get a chance to see that. 
We've got the NWA shows this week and a ton of stuff going on, but we're going to have to get into it tomorrow with Jim Valley. I shall talk to you all again after a while.